It's episode 49 time for this podcast where every Tuesday Japan time, I drop an episode on something wacky in the world of entomology. We had no listener submissions for this week, which means I got to choose. But there are polls on the Patreon where you yourself can vote on which insect you want to hear about, along with bonus episodes for an entirely separate series I'm writing and producing talking about cool news and discoveries in the world of entomology. If that sounds cool to you, or you just want to support the show, you can hop on over to the Insects for Fun Patreon page. Now, without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Cicada killers are large ground-dwelling wasps in the family Crabronidae, and most of them fall into one genus known as Sphesius. These wasps are found worldwide, as you can imagine, with 21 species in the Sphesius genus, but not all of them kill cicadas. That being said, the four found in the United States do. The most well-known species to people in the States would be the Eastern Cicada Killer, scientifically known as Sphesius speciosus. And it got a lot of press when people had the Asian giant hornet scare. The reason is because the wasps are similar in size. And to someone who is freaking out and doesn't know how to identify them, they'll just immediately think giant wasp equals Asian giant hornet. I mean, let's be honest, if you saw a massive wasp flying around and had no background in entomology, you too would probably assume the worst and maybe even dial up your friends and or family for your last words. Now, fortunately for listeners of this podcast, I will be equipping you with the knowledge to save yourselves any such embarrassing moments. Cicada killers are large. They are all large, usually two inches in length with black or maroon bodies with yellow stripes and reddish wings. They look scary for sure, but they actually want nothing to do with you. Pictures as usual will be available on the Instagram and Facebook page, but for the hundreds that prefer a verbal description, here we go. The main differences between a cicada killer and an Asian giant hornet are the body shape and coloration. Cicada killers have a black abdomen or some other color with broken or non-uniform bands of yellow. Asian giant hornets have many relatively even bands of black and orange slash yellow. Also, the heads of Asian giant hornets are vastly different. Cicada killers have small heads and their eyes take up the majority of the head space, while Asian giant hornets have big yellow or yellowy orange heads and their eyes are more centered. Also, most of the time, you will encounter a male cicada killer, which has no stinger at all and has a longer, more narrowed abdomen when compared to an Asian giant hornet. When in doubt, scream and shout. Kidding, just don't get super close and or swat it. The life cycle of a cicada killer begins when a female wasp mates with a male within his territory. She then begins building a nest for egg laying within soft and sandy soil, typically in full sun near trees to get easy food. The holes have to be big enough to fit a few cicadas inside, so they aren't small either. Once an adequate food supply is stored, she lays an egg on the body of a cicada, and then begins making a new side chamber to repeat the process. She will most likely make up to 15 chambers for eggs within a single hole. And as you can imagine, that's kind of a pain to anyone who cares about their lawn. A really cool fact about these wasps is that the females can choose the gender of the eggs they lay, which is something I've briefly mentioned in older episodes. The reason they do this is because it takes more females than males to create a sustainable population. And depending on the gender, more or less cicadas are required. For example, female eggs need at least two cicadas in the egg chamber, as opposed to male eggs which only need one. The reason is because male wasps are actually smaller than the females, and require less food to mature. Anyway, once the eggs are laid, it takes a few days for them to hatch, and begin feeding away on the food left for them. The cicadas aren't actually dead either. They've simply been paralyzed, and this keeps them alive and still until the larvae can fully develop into a pupa. Some blogs online might tell you the adults feed on cicadas too, but this is actually not true. The adult wasps are pollinators and feed from flowers and on plant sap. Just like all wasps, cicada killers have complete metamorphosis. And because all of it happens in the ground, you would never see a larva or pupa unless you decided to dig up a nest. 
The larvae for cicada killers usually take around 10 days to fully develop. And in areas with four seasons, the larvae prepare for winter by creating a cocoon underground where they stay dormant as a pupa until the next summer. Cicada killers are solitary, which for us is a good thing because it means they live alone and don't have a defensive hive mentality seen with hornets and other wasps. The behaviors are actually similar to carpenter bees, which we talked about in episode 37, with the males being very territorial, but they're all bark and no bite. Unequipped with a stinger, these male wasps are harmless and only fight others in aerial combat through tackling each other. The females have stingers in the form of a modified ovipositor, which in simple terms is the egg-laying tube. They aren't territorial like males and chances are you won't encounter one. They spend almost all their time preparing their nests underground. And when they are on the hunt, it's only for cicadas. If you're lucky, you might find one mid-flight carrying a cicada, which is really cool to see. It's also really cool to see them digging out a nest because they can move hundreds of times their own weight in soil within a few hours. The females are attracted to sandy soils or soil that is on the edges of sidewalks, concrete slabs, and building foundations. Many people spot them next to driveways or near stonewall gardens. That being said, I have never encountered them in Vermont, and I had sandy soil in a portion of yard with plenty of cicadas around, so I'm not sure what the deal is. I even checked a map with their sightings and known locations only to find that they avoid Vermont and Maine, but for some reason they're in New Hampshire? Maybe things will change with the ever-changing climate, but yeah, kind of strange. Before we move on, there is one more interesting behavior seen specifically in female wasps. Sometimes conditions aren't great for cicadas, and some areas might have less food available. In situations like these, female cicada killers actually go into dens made by other wasps and lay their eggs on those cicadas. Sometimes they'll even try to add an extra cicada to the nest before the other female returns, with some taking so long that they actually get caught and evicted. But in those situations, the eviction is just a matter of the intruder fleeing the scene. There isn't really a major fight or anything seriously consequential. Now, when it comes to what eats a cicada killer, it kind of feels more like what doesn't eat cicada killers. I mean, everything from mice to bears, bats to birds, frogs, salamanders, even other insects all snack on these large wasps. Birds will also go as far as to steal cicadas right out of their hands mid-flight and the wasps don't do anything about it. In another twist of irony and cruel fate, a different wasp referred to as velvet ants, which we'll talk about in a future episode, actually stalk cicada killers and will lay eggs in their nest with velvet ant larvae feeding on the larvae and pupae of cicada killers. This type of interaction is referred to as parasitization, which I talked about in the Just Bugs collaboration episode. The only defenses cicada killer wasps seem to have are their large and scary looking bodies and a stinger. But again, these wasps are not aggressive and will rarely use it, which is how they get bullied by other animals so easily. But you wouldn't do that, right? This concludes today's episode. And as always, if you've enjoyed it and or are enjoying the podcast, it is super appreciated if you decide to rate it and leave a review if you can on whatever platform you listen. And of course, there is a Patreon that you can check out if you'd like to support the show, which has exclusive benefits like bonus episodes, polls, and behind the scenes content. If you'd like to send a listener submission with something you want to learn more about, you can do so on the Instagram page or insectsfordummies at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and you'll hear from me again next week.